Hi everyone, it's your boy Zach, and uh, I'm watching uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, which has been out forever. <laughs> it started in like 2000, right? That's when I went into the Marine Corps. It's like, it was still going, at least recently. I never liked the idea. I was always like, who is this weird, ugly, wizard-looking guy? And isn't he just redoing Seinfeld? Well, it's actually really interesting. So what we find out is from Seinfeld that the Seinfeld character <laughs> and the uh, 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 what it, George character... They're basically both aspects of Larry David. So he's basically both of those characters in real life. And in Curb Your Enthusiasm, he gets to be, you know, both of them. So that just makes you say, like, what did Jerry Seinfeld provide? <laughs> because apparently his character was based off of personality traits from Larry David. Anyway, Larry David's always having bright ideas, you know, and he's always uh, causing problems. So I recently got the Wall Street Journal to improve my financial literacy. And it's great, it's great. The problem is that the newspaper requires other things. It needs you to have a regular schedule and to eat breakfast, breakfast at a regular time and then hopefully have a commute where you can read. Like if you work in Connecticut, you wake up at six and you take the 7 a.m. train to Wall Street you have your breakfast, you read the, the front page, and then on the commute, you read the rest of it. It works. But if you just have a newspaper and you're your own boss and you wake up whenever you want, it just, <laughs> I just read that um, the Taliban is on their way to Kabul, but there's still time if U.S. does some air, we didn't do any airstrikes. We didn't. We didn't. That was like a week ago. Anyway, there was a good article in there about the, uh, the Berlin Wall because everyone talks about when it went down, you know, and they all love David Hasselhoff and they always show everyone dancing on top of the, the, the broken wall, but they don't talk about how it went up. So when it went up, it wasn't a wall. It was 150 tons of razor wire stretched over like 70 plus, you know, uh, uh, roads and, and, and paths and all these type of things. And it happened in the middle of the night on a, a some sort of German holiday. It was like the Children's Festival or something like that. Uh, it was something related to Easter. So like most people would, you know, uh, they'd be getting up something. They, they expected people to be asleep. That's the point. So you read, and the, uh, the leader of East Germany at the time, who was like very authoritarian, I know, plot twist, uh, he had no friends, but he threw a party the night before, and he invited all the generals, and then like at 8 p.m. they opened up these envelopes and they got the orders and they did it all at like 2 a.m. Uh, but all the things were pre-staged. And the reason he did it is because they had lost a fifth of their population. You know, when you got the, the freaking Stasi <laughs> in East Germany, the Stasi is basically SJWs. It's uh, uh, people who surveil others and, and uh, try to get them in trouble and try to terrify them. And... Nobody liked that. <laughs> so they just left and they left more and more until 20% of the population. So they were saying there, there, were, uh, there were towns that didn't have any doctors in them because everyone who had a skill that was valuable, those were like the first people to leave. So I've been talking about how crazed SJWs are and their, uh, their, uh, you know, the usual suspects on Twitter. And man, like it's, I've never seen anything like this. They are completely unhinged, lashing out at everyone. And it's because the Substack, it was kind of like this. The thing is, they're finding themselves on the other side of, you know, what would become the wall. The weirdest thing is, it's they got everything they wanted. They're like, well, we want to work in movies. So we're going to guilt you into putting us on, you know, primo Marvel and DC books. And everyone's like... You got it. And they're like, what? Yeah, no. Jonathan Hickman's like, uh, yeah, you guys write the X-Men. I'm going to go to Substack and make like a million dollars in the next two years. Uh, I'll, I'll bop back in to whatever. You got it. Peter, you got this, right? You got, you got this. You got this. I trust you. And he just bounces. And they're confused and they're angry and they're dumb. They're like, why did we get everything we wanted? Is there something wrong with this? Well, technically, no. There was nothing wrong with the mainstream comic book industry before you destroyed it. But 
the thing is that everyone with the ability to sell comics has left <laughs> the mainstream industry. I remember uh, years ago, Remender like left Marvel, although it looks like maybe he was kind of shown the door or it became unfriendly for him to work there. And everyone was just shocked. It's like, well, you'll just go start to death somewhere. He's like, no, I can, I can write my own comics that I own and I can get TV and movie deals, but mainly I just sell a bunch of comics consistently at Image. And everyone's like, that's crazy talk. Your whole goal is you set your goals in life when you're 12. I want to work for Marvel. And then you work there in your 20s or your 30s, and then you go, ha ha! The fictional teacher who said I couldn't work at Marvel, I got there! And then you're poor, and then you die. Oh, I forgot, you spend the last 20 years on Artist Alley hoping that a bored uh, dentist will give you $300 for a sketch. Whatever. So, um, they got everything they wanted, but they found out it wasn't what they wanted. Just writing random Marvel uh, comics doesn't open all the doors to Hollywood. It might have got you some attention a few years ago, but nobody really cares. It doesn't really lead to anything at all. So now these people are sharecropping billion dollar properties for $75 a page. And they're leaving and you ever see two kids or even the same thing happens with uh, dogs. Two dogs will fight over a dog toy. And then one dog will be kind of like, eh, whatever. And then the other dog is just like, just drops the toy. With kids, it's different. If one kid stops fighting, the other kid will, like, break the toy. It's like, I don't want this stupid thing if you don't also want it. What am I supposed to do? I don't even like this toy. I only wanted it because you had it. So uh, one of the reasons, you know, uh, uh, they feel they were tricked. <laughs> like, it was, it, like it was this, uh, what do they say? When you want to trap flies, you put, like, sweet water in a jar, and then they go in there, they get stuck in the water. Like, this was supposed to lead to a Netflix deal. You think we wanted to write Marvel comic books? We don't even read them. I don't know these characters' names. I skim the Wikipedia and then I get bored and I just write everyone as me. And my editor never corrects me. And apparently I've been writing them wrong, but nobody cares because everyone's just leaving? No. You have to come back or you have to be really sad. Eh, we all basically dealt with our heartbreak a few years ago. I mean, Jawbreakers was written originally in, geez, like seven or eight years ago. And it was because I finally started looking at comics again. And this is before SJW, but just things had changed so much that I was like, the Marvel that I loved, it just doesn't exist anymore. So let me write uh, comics that are like the Marvel that I loved. And everyone's doing their own thing. You know, some people just want to spam out a bunch of Netflix uh, pitches, but there is a consistent, not huge, but there's a consistent audience. Uh, for that. So Hickman left and Tinian left and Spencer left and now it's just a bunch of diversity hires just writing characters that they don't know who they are, that they have no interest in and getting sub-poverty wages and they're just really, really, really angry. What we were supposed to do is wail and gnash our teeth forever and just, no, no, we're, we're gonna get back in. Nope, nope. <laughs> the trick was just to leave and create your own stuff that you have control of that you benefit from, that nobody's your boss, you know, not a lot less bosses, you know, obviously everyone's got to pay the piper eventually. You got to pay taxes. You got to listen to customers or you lose them. But like just these, just these vague whims. I remember Peter David, he used to flip out. He's like once a year, they asked me to write one or two uh, issues into a company wide crossover. <laughs> Can you imagine now you have these story meetings where you have to spend half of it explaining to Vita that uh, Magneto and Xavier aren't brothers. They're brothers, right? It's like a sibling rivalry thing, right? Um, no, Vita, they're not brothers. I'm pretty sure they're brothers. <laughs> I had a, a roommate in college who insisted that Batman and Robin were brothers. It's like, they're brothers. Eh, no. <laughs> they're like brothers. Not really. No, they're just, they're not brothers at all. The Robins are all kind of vaguely siblings to each other. Um, but yeah, Batman and Robin are not brothers. <laughs> there's, your, there's your video title. So I thought it was very interesting, the idea that they had to build the wall, not to keep the enemy out, but to keep their citizens in because they were providing such bad options that everyone with ability, with intelligence was like, 
yo, what's up? I'm going to go jogging with like everything I own in a cart. Yeah, later. And they would just go, you know, to anywhere else but East Germany. So one of the things I think about is this, you know, this, this horrible divisiveness. And I am not doing the both sides thing. It is absolutely SJWs torturing people. That stuff that was done to Aaron Lepresti should not have been done to anyone. It was absolutely evil. They tried to destroy his whole life. They're calling him Nazi and KKK because he went on a fucking live stream. I always like when everyone's like, oh, you can't go on a live stream. Ethan Van Skyver said something mean three years ago. You called someone who's not a Nazi a Nazi today. Whenever someone's like, that's a bad man. I'm like, are you good? You're vicious, petty, and vindictive. You demand apologies that you immediately reject and weaponize as an admission of guilt. The divisiveness put into the comic book industry was done so to scare people from leaving the parts that SJWs control. Can you imagine if Rick Leonardi agreed to draw a silkworm one shot? These peers, these friends, would try to destroy every single part of your life. The problem is, there's a situation where there's a lot of stick and no carrot. It used to be if you followed the rules you could be almost guaranteed, not a great living, but a living. There were journeyman artists who would go 10, 20, 30 years just doing two years on a title here, graphic novel here, movie adaptation, a couple of stories in Marvel Comics Presents. And you, you go to Marvel for 10 years, you go to DC for 10 years, then you're at Dark Horse and you got, you could have a whole career. Now I totally understand if people follow the rules, even rules they don't like because they get a career, they get health insurance. Now you follow the rules and, and you get nothing. You get poverty. Or you get $75 to share crop a billion dollar property. And then if they do use your, you know, I mean, they mainly use stuff from Jim Starlin, but if they use one of Vidal's storylines in a movie that makes a billion dollars, it's literally been documented. The procedure is to send you a check for $5,000. Five fucking thousand dollars. So of course SJWs, SJWs are going to terrify anyone from leaving the areas they control because they can't offer something better. They can't draw people in. All they can do is stop people from escaping. This stuff done to Aaron was done because they see it's going to happen with other people. They see other mainstream artists are going to leave to work with, quote, bad people. So they've got to threaten them. They've got to terrify them. This isn't about Aaron per se, although he has to deal with the damage. It's about that next person. Well, I, I don't even want to throw out names because then they're going to preemptively go to that person and threaten them specifically. It was meant to terrify. I say this, SJWs are the bad guys, they're the villains. The funny thing is I actually saw uh, Rich Johnson refer to cancel culture as it existing. He's like, well, this happened to me 20 years ago. Cancel culture has existed for a while. It's like, whoa, three months ago, y'all were saying it didn't even exist. Now you're saying it existed and you were the first victim of it. I am telling you in 10 years, everyone, Rich Johnston, all these SJWs. I always hated SJWs. I stood against them. No, you didn't. <laughs> no, you helped them. You absolutely helped them. You helped them destroy an American industry. And now you're trying to prevent people from escaping to freedom and prosperity. I just mentioned Rick Leonardi because I already mentioned him before. I've got other artists I'd love to work with, but I'm not going to mention them because they're directly going to harm them in every single way. But there's going to become a point where I was talking to someone the other day. They say, I haven't had any mainstream work in a year and a half. Now, sometimes it's not apparent because they will have stuff coming out every three months. And you're like, oh, you're working steadily. Nope, I drew that a year and a half ago. That was the last thing I got. Um, that eventually, it's literally going to be, uh, I starve, I become homeless, or I break these rules, and the same three dozen uh, Twitter accounts are going to call me a Nazi. I mean, when people have to choose between being evicted or starving, absolutely, they're going to do 
uh, their own thing. And that's when that's when the worm is going to turn. That's when uh, we're already seeing. It. I mean, and people, you know, Howard Chaikin, Rich Johnson. Yeah, of course, cancel culture is real. Of course, it is. No shit. We were saying that all the time. We were being gaslit. Starting in in just a few years, but definitely in 10 years, everyone's going to talk about these times and how they stood up to SJWs, how they hated cancel culture. They never supported it. And the reason cancel culture has to exist is because it's it's, it's a wall. It's a concertina wire. It's razor wire. These are three different things. Although you can stack them on top of each other. Um, uh, and uh, I, the, the worst one is the concertina wire with the razor wire inside. That's just, come on, quit being a jerk. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, um, the reason they have to divide is because they cannot offer something preferable. I always say this. Everyone's like, haha, this person denounced uh, Comicsgate. Um, did they have the option to not do that? I'm sorry. Could they just go about their life without denouncing Comicsgate? No, we saw that with Scott Snyder and Heather Antos. No, it doesn't impress me when they're forced to do it, when they will literally be tortured for years if they don't comply. Scott Snyder was on a weekend trip with his family and missed out on like the fourth round of denouncing CG that year. And Heather Antos, a junior editor, publicly shamed him. And he's always been in the crosshairs of the Whisper Network since then. So much so that he voluntarily left DC after they remade the entire DC universe using his concepts because it was just safer. It was just easier. He could get some distance. And all of his detractors, they don't get to follow him because they're not talented. They're stuck inside the the razor wire, the barbed wire that they put up. These are all different things. <laughs> Barbed wire, concertina wire, razor wire, they're all different things. <laughs> I'm just going to say barbed wire because that's the most common uh, phrase. Um, but uh, this, this thing about, you know, the Berlin Wall and that they had to do it because they were losing a huge portion of their populace and the most educated people in their populace, very trenchant to what's happening right now. So uh, uh, if, if you want to set things up, you know what I mean, that you are always against uh, SJWs, this is the time to kind of seed it in there. You know, Rich Johnson's like, oh, here's this article from 10 years where I clearly admit that cancel culture exists. Um, <laughs> anyway, thanks for watching. Wow, I am just blasting out like four videos a day. There's just so much to talk about. This is, a, this is an industry in flux and incredible things are going to happen in the next really shortly, year or two. Rock and Roll Ninja, Knife Hand Blind Spot, links are in the description, and I'll, I'll probably have five more videos before I go to sleep. Thanks, bye.